Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. sinus infection my voice is definitely getting better it's not 100 percent fortunately i didn't have too many other symptoms outside of uh, my voice and there was this one day where i couldn't stop sneezing um, but other than that uh, i'm good uh, so uh, what i want to talk to you about is something that's really dear to me, something that I put a lot of energy and effort into. And I want to kind of explain how I got uh, to where I'm at over the last 20 years uh, with a specific focus on young black males. Um, you saw the intro to this video. Uh, you know that we're raising funds, not just for Black Men Lead, but for the Odyssey Project in general, for our research center, for our think tank, for our programs, for uh, abused and traumatized women and girls uh, for wraparound services and mental health uh, services for the work we do for people who are wrongfully charged and don't have resources. I mean, we do a bunch of stuff and I've done it in multiple cities. I've gone to war with school districts on the East Coast and I'm, I'm in the South. Um, I go hard in the paint for my people uh, when I'm capable and when I am able to get to it and do it. I do it. We just need more resources so that we can expand our reach. There are so many people who are falling through the cracks. There's just not enough people with boots on the ground. There's not enough resources. And anything that actually works and serves the community, you're not going to get major funding for it. They don't fund stuff that works. They fund stuff that looks good, sounds good, and sells. They don't want you to win. They want to make it look like they're trying to help you win. And those programs hurt in a couple of ways. Number one, they hurt because they're not actually working. Number two, they hurt because it looks like millions of dollars are being funded into a program and we just can't get right. You gotta be real careful about that. You need to fund the people who love the people. And I'm gonna leave it at that. But uh, how did we get to Black Men Lead? How did we get to my passion uh, for racial socialization, my passion for healing trauma, my passion for understanding where we are as a people and how it imp impacts our our uh, our behavior. Now, what I can tell you is no way that I'm going to get this done in one sitting. I'm not going to even try. So they're going to be, uh, this is going to be a series. They're going to be on probably at least two or three more of these. Uh, whether I'm in the vehicle and I don't know wherever I'm at and I get a chance to shoot, I'll shoot the next one. But what I want to talk about is the journey. Uh, before I even started looking into African-American and adolescent young adult male violence, I started research into multi-generational uh, trauma. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, how that worked. Uh, and that was this argument that being pushed uh, that was, it's been, at, at the time I started, you know, it's been 130 years. And when are you going to say, okay, enough's enough. It's been 130 years and you're still talking about trauma. You're still talking about slavery. And so that was this push like, you know, at what point are you guys going to stop using slavery in, in relationship to trauma uh, when none of you were slaves? 
so I started doing the research. Uh, if you've read Post Traumatic uh, Slave Syndrome by Dr. Jared DeGroote, you have a familiarity with a number of different references that I also researched and studied and looked into. If you've read Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery by Dr. Naeem Akbar, if you've paid attention to uh, the writings and the teachings of Dr. Amos Wilson, if you've read uh, Franz Fanon's uh, Wretched of the Earth, uh, black skin, white mask. You get an idea of some of the things that I traveled through, but I went deeper. And so in, 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 in attempting to understand uh, trauma, you have to, un and it just so happens to be the vein I'm in. I am a psychologist and one of my focuses is in dealing with trauma. So I understand what trauma is. I understand how trauma works. I understand traumatic memory. I understand traumatic injury. I understand traumatic re-injury. I understand implicit memory and all that stuff like that. So I, I, I get how it works. So I understand that uninterrupted trauma has a way of lingering and resurfacing even in the lifetime of an individual that didn't go through what slaves went through. But what I wanted to understand is how can it go from people who were slaves to people who were never slaves and it be perpetuated and it seemed to be in some way exacerbated. And so the first thing was, could it be social learning theory? Well, that could be very easily applied to the children and maybe even the grandchildren are of, of freed slaves uh, because number one, people who are in a state of trauma tend to uh, behave dramatically. People who come from abusive situations tend to be abusive. One of the reasons that there's such an emphasis for blacks on whooping their kids. Now we're, we're starting to get to a place I think where we're coming out of that a little bit is because that's how we were controlled. When we didn't do what we were told to do as slaves, uh, the overseer pulled out the whip. When our children didn't do what they were told to do, we pulled out the switch, the belt, or whatever we could get our hands on because that's what you do to people who don't do what they're told to do. It's the way we demand the respect from our children, which was actually through fear and terror. And that's a form of trauma. So that that's trauma in and of itself. But I, I wanted to look deeper, so I started to look at other traumatized groups groups that you would look at and say what they went through that had to be traumatized Japanese internment camps things of that nature but the biggest group that I can think of with the most intense suffering in the closest proximity of time uh, in history were the European Jews who were terrorized uh, during the campaign by Germany so I looked at them so I started to study them and I found out there's some very interesting things going on uh, one there were instances where great grandchildren who were not alive when the Holocaust took place uh, and had not been told certain stories about what took place in, spe in specific were having dreams in great specificity about what happened and you know so we looked into it uh, we I'm saying science looked into it and what we discovered was there had to be some genetic uh, connection so then we stumble upon epigenetics epigenetics we study uh, and we found out that epigenetics means on top of the gene, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily change uh, DNA sequence, but it impacts GNA code, code or, GNA, or gene behavior, so to speak. So it can, uh, it, can, it can open up, activate, or close, and shut down gene behavior. So say, for instance, you had, uh, everybody's got cancer genes, right? Okay, so you have cancer genes and a certain number of cancer genes have to be uh, open and active. Upregulated is a term that's often used. You got the upregulation and downregulation of genes. Upregulation means the gene is turned on and it's active. In order to get a specific type of cancer, a certain uh, type and number of cancer genes have to be upregulated. Well, all at the same time, the genes that are designed to fight against uh, disease and sickness have to be downregulated. So there's a process of downregulation and upregulation, and bam, you get cancer. I studied this and wrote on it so much, not so much because of the cancer, but because of the amazing impact that environment and experiences has on health. A lot of the things that we think we're getting because of carcinogens, a lot of things we think we're getting because mom gave it to us, a lot of things we're thinking we're getting uh, because of our poor diet, 
a small percentage of that, it turns out, is actually because of any of those things. All of those things are contributors. The primary contributor to disease and illness is environmental experience. How you're experiencing life will either shorten or lengthen your life and give you a certain quality of life. And I'll get into that uh, a little later on. But in epigenetics, I've, I've written on this in collective cognitive bias uh, syndrome theory, uh, which is a theory I developed about our collective uh, way of thinking and our collective in, uh, way of thinking and how it influences us, which is also collective dominant, uh, 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 collective cognitive bias dominant cognitive bias theory um, and so those two explain a lot and I, I, I did a lot of this was 20 some years ago and I worked my way up and I looked through and dug through and my goal is try to find out how can we connect these things but I became so efficient at understanding how, epi, how uh, epigenetics impacts disease that I was actually invited in 2016 and 2017 to speak at the International Conference for Epigenetics and Cancer. Uh, one was in Frankfurt, Germany. So uh, which is kind of weird with, you know, Germany being what started me looking into it with the Holocaust. But uh, anyway, I, I look into it, it's all right. But what I found out is uh, when you experience trauma, your ce every cell in the body experiences it. So it's a genetic experience. It's a biological experience. It's not simply an experience of the mind. It's not just a memory. It's an encoding of an experience. And the problem with trauma is that it does not get integrated into your linear timeline and become a memory. It becomes a fixed, reoccurring reality. So in other words, when you have implicit memory or you have what's called traumatic memory, what you're actually having is an instance where you're reliving the situation as if it was really taking place. The smells, the sounds, uh, and, and so many other things that were present will all be there and you won't be seeing it as a memory. You will be seeing it as an immediate threat and that's called traumatic memory, traumatic response. So many uh, things that we see and we do, we don't understand, we're living it. So you have this on a, it's genetically coded. In other words, your body has a way of sensing things from a cellular perspective that will trigger your limbic system or your reptilian brain, the most ancient part of the brain, and trigger, and trigger what we call stress responses or fight or flight. Well, and if you've had significant trauma, it triggers it. And it didn't come from a thought. It came from a sound. It came from a certain sensation on a certain part of your body. So all different types of things can trigger it, right? So, but what happens is every time you go through a significant traumatic experience, you know, there's always some type of traumatic experience. You lose a loved one, you have a car accident, all those things. And depending on how uh, intense that experience is, it can be considered significant, uh, intensely tra traumatic, but uh, kidnapped, raped, uh, experienced or watched somebody get murdered, all of these different things are on a whole nother level. Uh, slavery would be in that category. Now, what happens is in that experience, you get what's called an epigenetic tag. That's literally a tagging of the gene where there's an imprint of that reality. Now, when you go through, uh, the body has two types of cellular reproduction. You have mitosis, which is where most of your body, uh, this, each cell, uh, reproduces two cells that look exactly like it before it dissipates and, and, and uh, dies. And so that's how the body regenerates over and over again is through mitosis. But in the reproductive system, it's called meiosis, and there's a different process. Through meiosis, uh, most of the genetic tags uh, are traumatic tags or epigenetic tags are basically, for lack of a better term, washed away but most more emphatic tags still remain behind. So you can literally take the 43, I mean the 23 chromosomes from the father, the 23 chromosomes from the mother, and those two make the 46 chromosome of a new individual. And within that could be a traumatic tag, uh, a, an epigenetic tag that houses the memory of a trauma. That's just the front end of epigenetics. Now the whole thing is, even after you're born, then now you're, you're also more likely to be traumatized when you experience trauma. Just experiencing trauma doesn't mean that you're traumatized. Uh, and a lot goes into traumatic thresholds and a bunch of other things. Uh, but what I, what, what, I, what I learned is that you can literally 
uh, pass down a genetic memory, meaning that child is carrying that trauma just like you carried that trauma. And that's one of the right, right ways that generational trauma is carried down, literally genetically. Uh, then we also learned that uh, epigenetics also creates an experience in which while you're living, if you're going through traumatic experiences, you're experiencing it on a genetic level. That's what we talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. We now know that ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, which can be uh, parents getting divorced, parents being abusive, parents being addicted to alcohol or drugs, parents being neglected. Uh, neglecting the children, parents going to prison, a bunch of other different things are all considered ACEs. Each one of those occurrences is called an ACE, one point. Well, we know now a kid with three to four ACEs is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide than a kid with no ACEs. We know that a kid with four ACEs is 45 times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease. We know a kid with four ACEs is more, what, four times more likely to develop type two diabetes and all these other health complications that's gonna come out in life that seem seemingly unconnected. We know now for a fact that it is directly connected and these ACEs have long-term effect. What it is, is a sub subcategory of epigenetics. You're talking about an epigenetic experience where you're creating Creating these tags that are going to impact health biologically and psychologically. There is no distinction in connectivity with psychological health. I mean, your psychological health and your and your biological health. Uh, uh, psychosomatics has been something that's been understood and acknowledged for years. And that is the connectivity between mental health and physical health. Uh, uh, having poor physical health will impact your mental health. Having poor mental health will impact your physical health. And so we understand that we're literally living this. Here's the thing. The worse the experiences in life, even after childhood, you, you, it starts to show up in your health. So this, is, this was studied with identical twins who share the same DNA. They were once the same ovum, the ovum split, and they became two. So they have the same DNA, same fingerprint, same everything, right? Well, they found one twin grows up, meets the love of their life, has a great life, taken care of, loved. The other one goes through some hardships, gets on drugs, whatever, uh, is in abusive relationships. And the more that that happens, the less indistinguishable they become. It becomes obvious who is who because one, one, one uh, is experiencing a psychological and biological uh, assault. The other one is living as best as they possibly can and extending their lives. And this plays roles. Uh, it increases the risk of cancer. Uh, cancer is heavily impacted by stress. And so we need to gain an understanding of that. Also, the survival of illnesses is impacted by stress. Uh, that's why hope is so important. Hope is actually a healer. Not in the mystic or uh, cliche sense, but in the real true sense of the world. It were the idea and the anticipation of something better happen creates a right mindset, creates a different chemical balance, releases the right hormones at the right time, and healing begins to take place. Faith is a powerful healer, not because there's some mystic belief, but because the anticipation that comes along with believing something is getting better creates the right mindset, the right mentality, the right emotional and mental environment. And so all of these things are things that I've learned and I try to apply when working with my clients. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of this thing. Epigenetics and psychology is something that I sort of coined uh, because nobody was making the comparison of the physiological components with uh, psychological components. I don't do simple psychology. Uh, I don't do Eurocentric psychology when dealing with my people. I approach it from an Afrocentric perspective. I approach it from a um, exhaustive exploration of possibilities. In other words, there are times that we need to have have the uh, client go and get 
CAT scans and PET scans and other th things of the brain because sometimes the behavior isn't uh, a mind thing, it's a brain thing. And the brain health is something that needs to be evaluated with tools that evaluates biological movement, brain currents, brain activity, and things of that nature. Once we do that, then we can see if the proper blood flow is going to the right place, the right type of brain activity, electrical uh, current, and all the things that need to take place in the brain to, to understand how it, how the brain is um, health-wise from a neurological perspective. And so then we can sit up and say, well, this is the problem. There is a hyperactivity in this particular area of the brain, or there is a lack of activity in the prefrontal cortex. And if there's a problem with the prefrontal cortex, then we're going to have a problem with impulse control. So that's why they keep doing this, and it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense that they're doing it, and it's counterproductive, but they keep doing it. It's an impulse, and impulse is controlled by the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex. So all of these things are things that we do. And the more we understand the genetic elements and components, uh, and I've simplified it a lot, but because I wanted to get something in before I got got, got done, and I'll, I'll pick this thing back up and go over the basics. But uh, this is number one in a series of at least three. Uh, and so, what I'm trying to get you guys to understand is what we're doing at the Odyssey Project isn't just on the surface. It isn't just go out. Yes, you need er effort. You need boots on the ground. You need soldiers. You need people to do that. But you also need minds. You need brains. You need research. You need program development. You need think tanks. You need uh, the ability to come up with solutions, plans, strategies, agendas. This thing doesn't happen because you wish for it. It happens because you plan for it. You strategize for it. You execute. That's how I've done everything in my businesses, in my book writing, in my uh, academic career, in everything I've done. It's about strategizing, creating plans, and executing. And it's going to take that. So when I'm asking for your support, I'm asking for it because I'm bringing something to the table that very few people are. Uh, you know, I'm not here to do debates and show up on panels and look pretty and talk about stuff. I'm here to say, hey, man, that's some stuff we can be doing that can give us an advantage. That's some stuff that we can be doing that can help us alleviate a lot of this uh, stress, a lot of this uh these problems. And the same thing came when I started doing research on African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. And I'll get into that as well. But this is what I'm leaving with, leaving with you now. We need to become more unified. We need to become uh, more aware. We need to get behind the ones who are capable of making things happen. We need to have a unified movement towards something better. Sitting up and complaining is not a plan. It is not a plan, nor is it a strategy. Complaining and whining is not a strategy. We are going to have to devise plans and execute. It's that simple. Thank you for lending me your time. Uh, I'll be preparing to do uh, the second of, of this series probably tomorrow sometime, and we'll keep it moving. On that note, thanks again. Hopefully, that hopefully uh, you'll give it. I appreciate it. Thank you.